Today at the Virtual Cambridge Union, we are welcoming Mike Tomasello and Paul Bloom in collaboration with the Cambridge University Psychology Society. Mike Tomasello is an American developmental and comparative psychologist, as well as a linguist. He is the professor of psychology at Duke University and is the recipient of multiple awards, including the William James Book Award and Distinguished Scientific Contributions. Paul Bloom is the Brooks and Suzanne Reagan Professor of Psychology at Yale University. His research explores the psychology of morality, identity, and pleasure. Paul is a recipient of multiple awards and honors, including the Million Dollar Pause, Mike and Paul. Hey, how you doing? All right, how you doing, Paul? Good, good. So let's start this like we talked about. I want to say, Mike, what have you been up to lately? Well, uh, I just submitted a new book, so that's a real uh, that's a real conversation starter, isn't it? An another one. Yes, uh, this is this book is called The Evolution of Agency, and I guess it has two sort of it's uh, it comes out of two things that sort of uh, coalesced. Uh, I've in the animal world, even the people studying cognitive processes, they're studying all kinds of complicated things, you know, chimps' math abilities and theory of mind and all that. But the overarching theoretical framework has a lot of behavioristic uh, leftovers so that people still talk about stimuli and responses and, um, and animals viewed as very passive. So I've always wanted to take kind of a cybernetic uh, control systems kind of model and map it on to, uh, uh, to our, uh, I start, the, the, the subtitle of the book is From Lizards to Humans. So I actually start with lizards, <laughs> with, with uh, reptiles. Uh, but then the, the second uh, piece of that is thinking about shared intentionality as shared agency, which uh, some philosophers have done. And so you think we form a shared agent to pursue shared goals together, et cetera, et cetera. So it just came together to think about to, uh, a kind of a feedback control model of the functioning of organisms in general. And you can start with very simple ones and then you add on layers of executive control and executive decision-making and metacognition and so forth. And then when you get to humans, you got to add in all this uh, shared agency stuff. And so I, I tried to paint a picture uh, from fairly primitive creatures uh, up to humans of how they sort of function as agents. So that's what I've been doing for the last year. <laughs> that sounds uh, remarkable. I mean, it sounds like um, it sounds like it typifies a lot of your work, which you know you, you've got many, many strengths as a scholar, including productivity and your gifts as a mentor and a colleague, but also you're very cross-disciplinary, and and this seems to cut across the comparative literature, but also links up to philosophy in a sophisticated way you often don't see in our field. So I can't wait to read that. Um, Great, thanks. So. Um, I'm, uh, I'm also finishing a book. I have it, I have it um, coming out in November. It's going to be called um, Sweet Spot, The Pleasures of Suffering and the Search for Meaning. And it's, about not, it's not about sort of what we normally talk about. It's about uh, why we sometimes like suffering, why, sometimes some, why suffering of the right sort sometimes gives um, meaning to our lives. Um, more sort of empirically, uh, my own research program, I'm pursuing different lines of work with some great students on different aspects of morality. With, um, with Emily Gurdon, I'm doing some work on dehumanization. I'm a, I'm a bit of a dehumanization skeptic. I don't think that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty hot topic. So that, and so your, yes. your, 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 uh, your uh, skepticism will be uh, interesting, I think. Yes, I got in early on the dehumanization skepticism. And then Harriet Over wrote some wonderful articles criticizing. We could talk about this. Um, and people are going to be wondering, how could you be skeptical of dehumanization? But the, the part of the argument that Emily and I make with kids and with adults is that a lot of what goes on when you treat another group horribly isn't that you see them as less than human. You fully recognize their humanity. You just hate them. You hate them and you want them to suffer. So that's that's one line. Well, I read that. I think I read that on something of yours. You have some stuff out on that, right? Yeah. I, that, I wrote a New Yorker article where I that's that what it is. It's something where it says like, yeah, if you dehumanize them, you don't. Why should you even care about them? You know, you want you want them to be fully human so they can suffer fully. And that, that's exactly that's the core argument. And that was that was not one that I would that's original to me. Um, uh, <laughs> the, the philosopher Kate Mann has made it. Um, uh, Kwame Anthony Appiah has made it. And it goes like this. You could imagine killing a bunch of people if they're in your way, and that could be dehumanization. You don't even think they're people, so you don't worry about it. But 
over history, people torture, humiliate, degrade others. And that doesn't seem to make sense from a dehumanization standpoint. If I thought they're cockroaches, I'm not fine. I'm not gonna make them suffer. But if I think they're people, I think they're threats to me and so on. So we're into that um, with, um, with Julia Marshall, who uh, uh, is now a postdoc. Uh, she sent some wonderful work on children's circle of obligations, and intuitions of obligations and support, which connects very much with your work in your recent BBS paper. And, um, and finally, with, with Maddie Wilkes, who's a postdoc working with me, we're doing a lot of stuff on speciesism. And uh, Maddie's a very interesting claim that adults are speciesist in the sense that we value human life more than animal life, quite regardless of the fact that humans maybe are smarter or suffer more, just, just because we're human. And she argues that kids don't. So we have a psych science paper, some other co-authors making that case. So the that's kids, sort of- kids. Sorry, kids don't what? So kids don't value human. So I'm just, I'll make it concrete. We do these studies where we, um, where we, we tell the kids and the adults, there's a, a person on a boat and there's a dog on a boat. You can only save one of them, they're both sinking. Adults will say, save the person. Kids will say, majority save the person, but not as much. Now there's a person on a boat and there's 10 dogs. Adults say, save the person. Kids say, let me save the dogs. <laughs> so it's kind of it's kind of, parents are freaked out when they see these findings, uh, and we're we're continuing that work. And so that's sort of a snapshot of what I've been doing empirically. Uh, just to go back to what we're talking about personally, I've been at Yale since uh, 1999, and in a month and a half, I'm moving to the University of Toronto. So oh, I'm wow. there to say yeah, taking a job at at Toronto, which is where I am now. Uh, but you're from Toronto, right? I'm from Montreal, so okay. I'm, I'm I'm returning to my to my Canadian roots. Um, basically, be, being Canadian these days means you're not going to get the vaccine as quick as all your American friends, and that's that's the big that's the big difference. But you're going to have a functioning government. We'll have a functioning government, but honestly, I'd like to get the vaccine and go back to my functioning <laughs> back to my functioning government. I like okay. Canada as, as a wicked quarantine thing. Can I ask a question about the dehumanization and stuff? So yeah. it's one of the things that I've um, thought about a lot is that. And I, I, I don't know this literature so well, but it seems to me intuitively and uh, that um, uh, if you're in some kind of out group or minority group or something, it seems to me like being hated is not so bad. That's okay. I hate you too. It's being disrespected somehow. And now I don't know if that, that doesn't necessarily mean dehumanized, but it means that other people are seeing me as somehow not as worthy as yeah. you are, as the rest of them are. And that seems to me that's really harmful. That really gets in your head. That really um, does that. But if you hate me, you know, there are people that hate me. I hate them. So, you know, it, it, I, it's, it's not, it's not um, somehow uh, demeaning or whatever. So it seems to me that kind of relates to the dehumanization a little bit, but not in a direct way that I could draw the line. I think you're right. Um... Nora Catelli sent some nice work finding that if you think you're dehumanized, you think somebody doesn't think much of you, it just gets you furious at them. And I think we, we live with heated disagreement and hatred and, and all that stuff. There's, there's this finding from um, John, uh, I think it's Gothman, the, the marriage guy. Um, yeah. Anyway, his, his claim is, and I'm not sure how dangerous, but it, but it captured into which his claim is, you look at a couple and they scream at each other all the time. That doesn't mean they're gonna break up. That just means they yell, they, they have huge disagreements. But if what you see is contempt, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, this yeah, eye rolling like contempt, which which is very much saying, you're not even a person to me. You're not, you know, that's the death of a relationship. And so so unlike some people, I'm kind of a pluralist here. I do think we dehumanize. I think some of some of our behavior towards outgroups is dehumanization, but I think a lot more of it is simply um, hatred. And, and then we thought, and this is a point made by, by Kate Mann. She talks about misogyny in her book, Down Girl, and says, you know, um, a lot of analysts say women, men who, uh, who treat women poorly um, don't think of women as people. And she says, no, men who treat women poorly are just really pissed off at women for not giving them what they want, for not showing them proper respect, for not showing them proper deference. And so it's an interesting question. And, and now, as you pointed out, there's a pretty big debate in the field. It just seems so, to me like respect, respect is a key concept uh, yes. for me. And um, 
So I think that the two, two of the concepts that have been ignored in, in moral psychology and moral developmental psychology, because um, um, everybody's focused on sympathy and helping and pro-sociality and stuff. One of them is obligation, which as you say, I yeah. just wrote a paper on it. Thank you, you were the action editor on that. So uh, you're partially responsible for it. Uh, uh, and uh, the other is respect. And respect was very big in Kant's philosophy um, and Darwall, your yes. colleague at former colleague, yeah. almost former colleague at Yale, is very big on different kinds of respect. So I can respect, um, you know, um, LeBron James for being a great basketball player or something. That's a kind of a cultural higher than me. But, but respect, of, respect people as a human being that I respect. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just respect people as being equally deserving as me. So um, it strikes me, and this is an argument that was, that's also made by um, Thomas Nagel in his book on the possibility of altruism, which is that um, me seeing you, having respect for you as equal to me in all important respects and equally deserving as me is not really a motivation or a preference it's, it's just the way I see it. It's just the way the world is. I can't help but recognize that these other people have a reality just like me. And so I want, I wish I was more deserving than you. I wish I could have all the stuff and you didn't get any. But not, I can wish that all I want, but it, I can't convince myself that it's true, that, that I'm more worthy than everybody else on the planet. So there's something cognitive about the recognition yeah. of others as um, moral agents like yourself. Um, and if they're worthy of respect, it seems to me you're halfway there. Uh, uh, and again, it relates in some oblique way to the, to the dehumanization and stuff. If I really you know, view you as, as equally worthy or deserving as myself, then um, uh, well, then you're in, you're in the moral community in some yeah. sense. I think that's a really deep point. Um, I'll just jump on the, on the first thing you said, which is that I was the editor of your BBS paper, but um, for those people who don't know how the editorial system works, you know, I just collect the reviews and the reviewers have a lot to say in your paper. I was a conduit to all the good things people had to say about your work. And then, and then it came up as, as the way BBS works, there's a discussion where you're swamped with like 30 respondents and, and it was quite an issue. And that was a really, I think it brought forth a lot moral psych um, really advance through that back and forth. So thank you I for agree. submitting this. Um, I think your point about respect is exactly right. And I think it illustrates two things that we tend to miss in discussions of development. First, we tend to have, I think, a very narrow and very shallow notion of what moral capacities and moral feelings are. We tend to think the whole question is, well, are, do kids have compassion? Do they have empathy? Do they have sympathy? Do they have altruism? And as if that ends everything. Well, the true suite of moral emotions we deal with include respect, they include righteous anger, they include gratitude, and your work, and an obligation, and your work more than just anybody else's captures a richness of moral life and brings it back to developmental psychology. The other thing I would say is that um, there's a big move in our field, and maybe we go back and forth on this, to say, well, people are fundamentally irrational when it comes to morality. We don't think about it. We don't, we don't, uh, we just go according to our guts. It's very big in social psychology. And I think that that's really not true. And, and your point about respect illustrates how it's not true because we do have the capacity, maybe we're not born with it, maybe two-year-olds don't have it, to sort of step above our own situation. And that's what you're talking about. You and I are in, are in a deal and we have to split up, you know, 400, we have to split up the, the $1,000 honorarium for giving this presentation we're doing today. <laughs> And, and you say, I want it all. And I say, I want it all. We really do each one at all. But then we say, well, if I wasn't me, you weren't you. We do the veil of ignorance. We do the impartial spectator. We step point of view of the universe, which we can do. Yes. Well, I have no prior right over you. And, and that insight that, that we're not special that everybody's due to respect is this profound moral insight. Which, which There's an example, open. and I forget where it comes from. It may even be Adam Smith. If you're, ta if you're re writing on suffering and stuff, have you read Adam Smith on? Uh... Have I read Adam Smith? I, when I wrote my book, I wrote a book called Again. You must and have, okay. And, 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 and at the beginning, I had to apologize because I said like, like, I'm going to look like an undergraduate who's read exactly one book. <laughs> so anything you want, but theory of moral sentiments, I'm your man. 
Okay, great. Well, we got a great study out of it where we had uh, um, difficulty having sympathy for someone who's like a crybaby who is... Uh, oh, who, yes. So we have what we call the crybaby study and you have people who, oh, I broke my fingernail and they're falling apart and you have trouble feeling sympathy for them even though they're in moral distress because it doesn't make sense. It's not justified. So Smith, Smith was in his personal life a really weird cat. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, I once went to an Adam Smith conference and there was a big debate over whether he had never known physical love from either a man or a woman. And he was like, <laughs> like um, I said we might get gossipy, but but we but <laughs> but but he was an incredibly astute observer. Uh, Unbelievable. More and, and and I love his conversations about friendship, which might be where your study came from, because he says, you know, you have a friend. And first, on the one hand, if they're blowing things out of proportion, um, then then we, we we try to sneer at him. Um, he has some funny line about somebody who complains that their next door neighbor hums a tune that's annoying to them, and they go on and on about it. And Smith says, "Our feeling isn't sympathy. Our feeling is we kind of want to smack him in the face and say, <laughs> get over it." But also, then there's the flip side, which is, you know, I have a friend, and my friend comes to me with this great accomplishment. And can I share in the joy of it? Well, it's hard. What if I wanted that myself? You know, we struggle with these different things. Yeah, no, he's, he's absolutely great on all that. The reason I brought him up was when you're talking about the richness of moral life, um, he was very big on resentment as well. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the resentment, it does seem to me, I don't think this example is from him, but it, it reminds me of him and it might be from him. So let's say you and I find a, you know, a um, hundred dollars on the street. Uh, and I say, oh, okay. I tell you, let's split it up. I'll get 51 and you get 49. Okay. Well, you don't care about $1. You're not, yeah. you know, that's not going to affect, but, but your reaction is uh, like, why? Yeah. You know, so, so you have to justify that uh, that I somehow think I deserve more than you do, and um, your big, your larger point about the rationality that the, from the social psychologists that we're all, um, you know, make these gut judgments and stuff. I understand where they're coming from. There's a lot of stuff we do where we just, and a lot of times they're studying disgust, which I'm not even 100% convinced is moral, but in any case. Uh, uh, where you just have this uh, gut reaction, but um, underlying it is a kind of a rational view of, again, ourselves as equal participants, everyone in yeah. the moral community is equally deserving. And that may not be part of my conscious judgment about this particular yeah. act in front of me, but the whole thing is structured by a kind of a rational structure, like, again, based on uh, respect and I get resentment if you don't treat me. But if, if, I'm, if I'm standing in line for a movie and I've been standing in line for an hour, those, those were the good old days back when we stood in line. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I've been standing there for an hour and you come and just cut in in front. Um, you know, yes, you could say I'm angry, but the real emotion, the more specific emotion is resentment. Who do you think you are? Why do you think you don't have to wait in line while the rest of us do? And so it seems to me that and that and and and, and um, Adam Smith says when you protest against somebody, um, you know, doing whatever to you or to treating, let's say, cutting in line or something like that. Uh, you're, he has a quote, I quote it somewhere saying, uh, uh, I'm, call, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of bringing your attention to the fact that I'm a person who does not deserve to be treated like that. Yes. <laughs> and I think so much of our everyday life is explainable when you have that insight in mind that we believe we're deserving of respect. <clears throat> like, for instance, if I come in front of you in line and I say to you, I'm really sorry, may I cut in front of you in line, which in some ways is like a silly thing to ask, but then also you're more likely to say yes, because I've showed you respect. Yeah, it's exactly if I, right. If I bump into you and it's plainly not my fault and I don't say I'm sorry, you get pissed at me because I'm showing that, that I don't regard you. I don't, have to, I don't have to make amends. I don't have to take steps to make sure to, to, to protect your, your, your dignity. Or take a third example. Um, behavioral economists love the ultimatum game. Which, you know, as you and I know, it's a situation where one person gets to allocate money to another person, like the $100. And the other person who gets the money, if they're not satisfied to deal, gets to, to burn it off, throw it all away. And the weird finding is if somebody gets less, even if it's a one-shot deal, they, they will often say, burn it all, because just to punish the person. 
Yeah. And it was a very nice study which says that instead of a burn at all possibility, the person who sees less gets to send a message back to the other person. <laughs> and so, so they do a study and, and that's it says, you know, you suck, you're a greedy person, you know, next time think more about this. And then, they, then they're not as prone to throw it all away because they manage to salvage their dignity. Yeah, okay, great, great, great. And so, and, and so one of the things we're really into, I, I mentioned the book I've written, I haven't, uh, I didn't talk about the empirical research we've been doing recently, but uh, I'm really into, um, uh, so in those kind of situations, like somebody standing in line or whatever. So um, from my side, you cut in line in front of me, I protest, okay? And moral protest, or whatever you call it, I feel resentment and I protest. I say, hey, what do you think you're doing? You can forestall that, as you said in your example, by saying, oh, listen, I'm going to ask you permission. Can I cut in line in front of you? So then you forestall my moral outrage and my moral protest by making, uh, um, by asking permission and showing me proper respect. Then you can do it, but make an excuse. Oh, gosh, I'm really sorry, but, you know, I had an operation on my leg yesterday and I can't stand in line that long. And I very likely might let you get away with it. So you've made an excuse kind of in the middle of it. So you can, you can either ask permission ahead of time, make excuse in the middle of it, or um, you can apologize afterwards. So you're in line and you, you cut in and get in really quick. And then you see me later in the theater and you say, listen, I'm really sorry, but you know, my child was sick in the movie theater. I got a call yeah. from mom or whatever. Yeah. And I say, oh, oh, okay, no problem. So these sort of apologies, excuses, uh, et cetera, are all, as you correctly pointed out, all about respect. I'm showing you the respect that you deserve while screwing you over. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, and I mean, it, it shows something about people, which is, you know, we're, sometimes you know, perhaps in some hypothetical age, everybody thought we were just selfish maximizers. We only care about, about the tangible things. And then people said, no, that can't be true. Throw in some altruism, throw in some of this. But the truth is, for the most part, we work on a currency that has nothing to do with food and water and how much you have to stay in line. We work on a, on a currency of respect. I was, I was reading an article on, by um, Marty Seligman and Ed Diener about uh, the happiest people in the world. These are the people who are like in the top 1% on Gallup polls of happiness. And they differ from the rest of the world in all sorts of ways. They make a bit more money. They, blah, blah. But one thing which really struck me is like 96% of people claimed that people regularly show them respect. When mm-hmm. you take the next tear down, it's like 60%. And, mm-hmm. and there's like, this seems to be a necessary quality for, you know, for true satisfaction. So you, you're, you're a developmentalist, I'm a developmentalist. When do you think a lot of this is in place? Well, I mean, I've written a paper called The Normative Turn at, at three years old. So I think, a lot, I think three is a, is a really um, a big age for this. I don't know if there's some precursors before that or whatever, but it's expressed in their natural behavior through this protest behavior. I mean, yeah. in all of my st- studies that I've done, one of the coolest ever was when Hannes Rokachi came in and with these films and said, look what these kids are doing. No, don't do that. That's wrong. You know, and they started doing this protest at three years old, even in third party situations where they're not involved. You're not messing me up, but you're just breaking rules. So the protest with normative language, like you can't do it that way. You must do it this way. You should do it this way. Um, That's about three in the obligation paper for BBS. I argue that that's about the age where, kids will start, um, especially if they've been collaborating, dividing things up equally, even when they really like to have it themselves. So there's a sense of fairness uh, yeah. in the division of resources, a sense of fairness in, um, in maybe retributive justice kinds of situations. Uh, it's when they start using normative language. Again, it's conceivable that, that um, they have something a little earlier, but I'd say three is what I've called the normative turn. And I think that's about, um, uh, yeah, that's what I would say. And you see fairness, and I've read an article of yours on this, you see fairness as not just a sort of um, optimal allocation of resources, you see that as grounded in respect. You see well, it has to be. I mean, look, look, at, look, at, the, look at the process of uh, procedural justice or procedural fairness. So you and I are gonna split up some things and I say, okay, I'll take seven and you have three. And that's the ultimatum game. And you say, 
to hell with you. But I say, let's roll some dice or spin yeah, a wheel. That's right. That's okay. Right. And now you get three and you say, hmm, you know, gosh, I was unlucky. But, but we, ha- we were treated equally. That's right. And, That's right. and so uh, there's a, we have another study. And so we have a study with five-year-olds of that. So does uh, Alex Shaw. And we have another one uh, where um, these puppets, there's a division where it's equal, five and five, or it's seven in my favor and three in your favor. And I'm the puppet and you're the child. And the puppets in every condition say, oh, we're going to take the seven and give you three. But in one condition, they ask, what do you think we should do with these? You know, and then they and then the child says what and they say, well, and, and then there are various ways that they justify it. But, it. but even when they hardly justify it at all, they say, well, we think the seven three is better. But I ask your opinion. I let you in on the yeah. decision. And so the yeah. kids are happier with it. And so I would say that, you know, uh, this this procedural justice, you can think of the law is exactly like that. This is kind of the veil of ignorance. Uh, that, that's what rolling the dice is. It's the veil of ignorance. So you want a, you don't necessarily want a government that, you know, dictates equal outcomes. You just want to have everybody has an equal opportunity. And then you sort of say, well, okay, I was unlucky or I didn't take advantage of my opportunities or whatever. And you're okay. And in a, and in a, um, you know, bosses all over the place know you want to keep your employees happy, you get their opinion. You say, well, what do you think? Yeah. What do you think we should do? And then you can yeah. do what you want to do anyway, but everybody feels respected. So yes, the paper by Jan Engelman and I in, in Trends in Cognitive Science uh, is called Fairness as Equal Respect. And it's what you were saying before about the impartial spectator and all that. It's that you've gone up and you're treating yourself the same way you're treating everybody else with equal respect and you're treating other people with the same respect that you think you deserve and that you expect them to give you. Um, and, you know, now, now we're all, now we're all morally um, satisfied in so, at some level, or we, we feel equal members of the moral community and we don't feel diminished or uh, whatever. And I think, so I think respect is absolutely the, in many ways, the, the bedrock of the sort of fairness and obligation side of things, as opposed to the sympathy, compassion side of things, which you also have been quite brilliant in your skepticism uh, there. Uh, and, uh, uh, um, and so anyway, the, the respect, fairness, obligation side of things, uh, what, what the philosopher Tim Scanlon calls what we owe to one another yes. um, is, yeah, uh, um, yeah I, th- I think respect is sort of the most basic. So an observation and a question, an experimental question. Maybe maybe it's been done. Maybe we, you and I could do this. The observation is this is some work I did with uh, Mark Shestian and Christina Starmans. And um, it turns out people think that they don't like inequality. They don't like unequal societies. But you have to look at the data. People prefer unequal societies than pure, to purely equal societies. They don't even mind grossly unequal societies. What they hate is unfair societies. Yes. And often they correspond. So no one, no one's upset that J.K. Rowling, you know, or or LeBron James has a lot of money, more money than me. They say that's okay. They're better. It's, it's okay. It's a, it's a fair system. If I was to write like the one or be an athlete, the other, I'd get paid, so I'm fine. It, it's when they think that these things are unfairly allocated, they freak out. Here's the here's the hypothesis, and maybe this has been done, but um, but it, it's sparked from what you were telling me, which is we're both interested in punishment, and You can imagine roughly two reasons to punish. One reason is consequentialist, which is I punish with the goal of, well, if I punish you, you'll do it less. Um, And, you know, so, so no hard feelings. I don't want you to suffer. It's just, it's just a way. And, and many moral philosophers, that's the only reason we should, we should punish. But other one's retributive, which is I'm going to punish you. It's going to hurt you. And I don't care if it makes the world better or not. It's going to hurt you. And that's what you deserve. And I wonder whether maybe paradoxically, we only apply retributive punishment to those who we respect. Ah. So I might, I might consequentially punish my dog, you know, for, for this is related to your dehumanization thing. It seems to me. It is. That's right. That's right. Um, To some extent, me, me saying, I'm going to, I'm going to make you pay for what you did. Not, not because I'll make the world better, but because, because you've got it coming, man, is a sign of respect. Yeah, no, if, I, if I'm out in the woods and, I, and a wolf bites me and, you know, rips a hole in my leg, I don't say, I'm going to make you pay, you son yes. of a bitch. I mean, right? Okay, he's a wolf. Yeah. You know? 
Uh, and, I guess and, Ahab is an exception, but uh, <laughs> for, for the most part, <laughs> a, Ahab anthropomorphized the the whales. Ahab, that's that's the problem. Yeah, <laughs> he was so that's, stuck that's, in. that's that's the opposite of dehumanization is anthropomorphizing yes. animals. I guess. Yes, that's right. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah. So that's a, that's an interesting idea. The the. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, okay. That's interesting. I, I um, yes. Yeah, I never thought of this before, and it goes against a sort of common view, which is retributivism is this ugly extension of you know, it's just it's just a sort of a primitive, irrational action. But yeah, well, it's what you get when you treat people as people and not as sort of push pull things that you manipulate. Have you read the Nietzsche where uh, Nietzsche has a whole thing where uh, I think, I don't know if it's beyond good and evil or no, I think it's the genealogy of morals where he's okay. talking about all the stuff where the, in the medieval times where they, you know, put people on the rack in the city square or hung them from the city square. Yeah. You would get these big crowds that would be cheering. It was like a big event on Saturday to come in and see the hangings and stuff. So it wasn't just that yeah. people did this stuff. It was that the other people enjoyed watching it. No, it's true. And, and I don't think you're on social media that much. I'm not. Oh, you're a lucky man. Don't, 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 get, don't ever get tempted. But no, I, I never, spend, I've never been tempted. I spend only about 90% of my waking hours on Twitter. <laughs> and, and, and there you see what you're saying. You see this tremendous love for punishing people, for publicly yeah. humiliating people. Yeah. Yeah. They're always bad people. They're always bad people. So everybody feels, oh, this is great. I'm doing the right thing. And, and looking at social media, you would think our dominant uh, uh, moral emotion is that of sort of righteous indignation. And, yeah. and I, th I think that, that even this does need some sort of correction. You were, you were mentioning, uh, you know, you're talking about, uh, has that study been done before? Um, I, I, it, all of a sudden it, it occurred, to, it reminded me of, Experimental philosophers. I don't. I don't know who it was. It, it might have been uh, your your guy at Yale there. Um, um, Josh Noel did every study that. Yeah, exactly. That it might have been him, him, but I don't remember. But it was a study where they asked people about, um, you know, somebody murdered, you know, in cold blooded murdered a family or something, and uh, we're going to put him away for life in a luxury hotel. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and that way, you know, he'll be away. He won't be able to ever do it again. You know, he's out of society. We've served the function of uh, protecting everybody from it. We've taken away his, you know, yes. whatever. And people, of course, not, not even for a minute. Would they, would they, they don't like uh, that. No. They don't like that. Though, if it was a bear, a bear that mauled somebody, and somebody says, well, let's put the bear in a zoo with cages that'll have a happy life, but it won't hurt anybody. Most people would say, yeah, that's okay. Most people would say that was okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, punishing people like that is a sign of respect. That's really yeah. not thought of that at all. It, it kind of explains something, which is, um, this is getting very cosmic, but why we're often so cruel to those we love the most. And I because, you know, we're, we're, we're intertwined with them. I mean, there's other things, of course. Injuries to ourselves feel more intense when they're inflicted by, by loved ones rather than strangers. But one of the things, uh, and, and I, think, uh, I think this is one of the evolutionary sources. Now, evolution, everybody has to stay clear that the evolutionary sources are not the same thing as the psychology of the people today. But some of the evolutionary sources for kind of uh, this respect and whatnot, I think, come from the central concept that that I borrowed from some uh, people and, and, and elaborated of interdependence. The chimps, chimps go around, you know, they sort of do their thing and they they they, they groom a little bit and they do a few things together. But they're out foraging. They'll be in a small party, but each one of them gets his own thing and separates and eats and stuff. And they're kind of doing their own thing. And in all of our experiments, they kind of very clever, but doing their own thing. And they're a little bit interdependent. They don't want to be separated from the group and, and so forth. And they need coalition partners. But humans become so dependent on one another. We're so interdependent for doing everything. And, and even in human evolution, it's for getting our everyday food and, and stuff. And so 
Then you've got the notion of partner choice, that we're going to interdependent, we're going to yeah. do things together. I need, I need you if I'm going to go um, you know, hunting an antelope, I can't do it by myself, so I need you. And at the same time, I'm smart enough to know, haha, but he needs me. He can't treat me like shit you know, because he needs me, all right? And I need him. And, uh, um, and so there, there is, I, I can see how the kind of seeds of respect come out of this acknowledgement. I, I just don't think respect would be a relevant concept for chimps. I mean, there might be like, I respect the dominant in the sense that I was saying, I respect Le LeBron James for being a great basketball player. I respect the dominant as being able to, you know, beat me up and, and take charge, but respect as a kind of a, you know, moral respect, this equal respect thing. I don't think it's sort of relevant uh, uh, for chimps and it becomes relevant for humans when there is this, um, uh, we're collaborating together. We're both equally needed yeah. to, to accomplish it. Um, the, the roles that we play in the collaboration, anybody who plays the role, these are kind of role standards that apply to everyone. If we're going to catch the antelope, whoever plays this role has to do this, whoever plays that role has to do that. Yeah, that's right. So, so I, I just think this sort of cooperative, collaborative way of life, uh, uh, and, and, and of course, this being able to switch roles gets you ultimately to, again, what, again, what um, Adam Smith says and what the good, the golden rule says, which is, uh, you know, treat others you want to be treated. But Adam Smith says um, that um, uh, you're, you're basic, if you come and step on my toe, this may have actually come from Hume first, but you come and step on my toe and I say, hey, what are you doing? You're hurting my toe. And you say, I don't care. What do I care? You know, what is your ultimate, what, what is the only thing you can say if the other guy is saying that he doesn't care is that how would you like it if I did that to yeah. you? That's the, that's the only thing you can say. Right. And, and so this, this reciprocity of roles and this equality in the situation, uh, I think comes along with the evolution of human collaboration. I, I argue a version of that in my book, Just Babies. And I think I get it from Peter Singer, which is consistent with what you're saying, but it puts it in a slightly different light. It puts it in the light of a, of a community of people. They're not just interacting, but they're, they're arguing, they're talking. And so I have these excerpts from kids' conversations. And these are kids arguing over who gets what marble. I think they're from Melanie Killen originally, these, these dialogues. And these young kids, three-year-olds, they don't just say, I want it. They say, you had it yeah. for a while, now it's my turn. Yeah. Yeah. And the point I think Peter Singer makes, and other people make, is the power of that mode of thought is that it would convince a neutral third party. So imagine it's not just you and me facing each other. And maybe, you know, since I care about myself and you care about yourself, there's no point in convincing. But now there's like 10 other people around us. Now I have to make my case. And to make my case, I need to step above. And, say, yeah. it's good. and so kids in your age, three-year-olds will say something like, it's my turn. That's a phenomenal thing to say. That's basically saying in a short version, if one was to abstract away from the particular instance, the situation would favor me. So one of the th one of the interesting um, uh, things that kids do in these when we have them collaborating, which you know we have these studies showing that collaboration really elicits yeah. this idea of equal sharing. If we produce them equally, we produce them together collaboratively, then we should share them um, equally. Is if we rig it so that they pull in together, and I get three and you only get one, and it's an accident. I didn't even know I was going to get three. I got three. You got one. Quite often, the response from the what we call the unlucky child is, I only got one. Now, notice he doesn't even say what the other guy should do. He doesn't invoke a moral <laughs> principle. He doesn't say you should do this or that. It's in, it's in the common ground. It's implicit. I only got one. And, and so you know how to rectify that, right? And, and yeah. so they already assume that the other guy knows what I only got one means and knows how to write the, make it right. That's right. That's so, right. yeah. So, yeah. So that's what, you, when you were talking about the Melanie Killen arguments, that's, that's, that's what struck me is, is the arguments can somehow um, uh, just point out the facts of the matter with the morality of it assumed. I just am yeah. pointing out, I've only got one. And I just assume that you know what's wrong with that and you know how to make it right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's true for the adult case too. Like if someone pushes you in front of you in line, you just go, dude, 
and like <laughs> look, look, at the, look at the situation as 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 it as it manifested itself. Yeah, yeah, and and that's kind of what you you know you're talking about looking at it from an impartial perspective. That's kind of what you're doing when you say, "Hey, what are you doing?" You know, look at it either from my perspective or from a neutral perspective. Um, and the, the big debate you see in adult social psychology by you know people I respect like by John Height and others. Yeah. They seem to think that this plays a very minor role in our everyday commerce. Mostly, basically, we're just living on these gut instincts and these these justifying uh, what's to our advantage. But you know, I think I, I think we agree on this. You look all the time at the sort of negotiations people making, even in the most dysfunctional departments. In a faculty meeting, say somebody's going to say, you know, well, I'm teaching too many courses relative to everybody else, and there's there's very few societies so corrupt that everyone will say, who cares. <laughs> we got ours, you know. That's <laughs> true. I, I have seen it. I've seen a department or two that may be like that, but still. Uh, I'm free associating back to your point before that I wanted to say when you said the kids are arguing. Uh, I was in Germany for all those years, and and the the sort of dean of philosophers in Germany is of course Jürgen Habermas, and one of Jürgen Habermas's main points is that um, uh, having a discussion, having an argument is already a sign of respect. So if I think it's not even worth having a conversation with you, it's not, you know, you're, I'm, 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 I'm showing contempt that I think you're not even a good conversation. There's no point in arguing with you. You know, you, if you had a two-year-old child and they don't want to do something, you say, you know, just do it. Come on, you know, right? But, yeah. but at some point, you, uh, when you feel like your child is a teenager, you know, you owe them, let's have a conversation about this because you respect their whatever. So. Um, and how you are a political point of view that uh, yeah. engaging people in these public discussions is critical. And Habermas had an interesting take on free speech, which is one argument for free speech is a sort of John Stuart Mill one, which is this is the way we get the ideas out. Bad ideas, bad ideas get thrust out. Good ideas get seriously tested, and through, through the ability to say whatever dumbass thing I want, sooner or later we all get better. And everything. And Habermas had a very different take of that. He, he different perspective, which is no, the idea of free of a, of a doctrine of free speech is respect among members of the community. If you shut me up, no matter how vile I am, that 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 has as serious social and moral consequences. Cancel culture. Yes, yes. We finally we find as all discussions do, we have ended on on cancel culture. <laughs> um, are we supposed to, on that note, are we supposed to, do, we have, do you have questions for us? Yeah, I think, that, I think that goes quite well into um, some questions as we end on free speech, which is really something that we try to highlight as a society. Yes. Um, we, the first question. We aim, we aim to match whatever group we're in. To <laughs> the first question has come in from Melissa at Pembroke, and she asks, you touched on respect and its potential role in the happiest people. Do you believe respect is fulfilling the need to belong? And what are your thoughts on being respected by people online who have never met you? I guess it's for both of you. Um, I'll answer the second part. I think, I think feeling respected is extremely important. It's not as important as food and water, but it, it, it's really, it is really important. I think it's important for children, at least of a certain age, maybe not a one-year-old, but sooner or later, feeling like you matter, feeling like you're taken seriously. And as Mike said, this is compatible with somebody saying, you know, you're full of shit, you know, I don't believe you, whatever, that's fine. Um, online, there's often areas where you're not respected. Um, my personal experience from this is, um, if I, you know, I wrote a controversial book, I sometimes say controversial, I, I get some stuff like that. If it's from a stranger, it doesn't mean much to me. I could just laugh at it, I showed my friends, I laugh at it. It doesn't mean nothing. I mean, I'm, I'm a mammal. I sort of, you know, we've evolved in a situation that, that, that even there are no true strangers. And, but if I get it from somebody I respect or somebody I know, it, it wounds. And so, so that's, and that goes back to Mike's point about, about the sort of circle of respect and the power that holds. Well, there's a, um, in, in the academic uh, world, this, um, uh, I think it was the, the physicist Richard Feynman, they were asking him about his, he's talking about these people are your theoretical enemies, what do you think? And he says, they're not even wrong. <laughs> so, so he, you know, like, like he, they're not even worth, they're not even worth having a discussion with, they're so far off base. Right. And that's contempt. And that's and, and that's a lack of respect. And that would wound a lot more than saying, you know, they're full of shit. And then and then and then showing you the respect that your ideas deserve to be 
you know, addressed and whatever. So I do think I do think that respect is is part of becoming a full member of a group. And I think people quite often it's not that they mix them up, but it's it's that the issues get muddled somehow between sympathy and, and respect. So if you say, you know, is my dog in my moral community or my child in my moral community? Well, in some sense, they are, of course, because I have sympathy for them and they need to be treated morally and that kind of thing. But a, a two-year-old child is not responsible for their moral decisions. I don't resent them cutting in line in front of me. I don't expect them to apologize for everything. Uh, uh, so they're not fully participant in the moral community. I don't show them the respect of, uh, of, of treating them as someone who can make judgments of blame and guilt and all that sort of stuff, and, nor animals either. So, so you're in the moral community because you deserve moral treatment, but to be a full member of the moral community, you have to be able to give as well as you get uh, and, and make moral judgments and enforce morals on other people and stuff. And so I do think that becoming, uh, the, the question was about becoming a member, coming to belong. I think coming to, be, coming to belong to a moral community um, uh, um, you have to have everybody's respect or you may be a worthy target of their moral concern, but you're not a full-fledged uh, participant in the moral discussion. Yeah, and this is, this is the problem with certain models of moral cognition, which some of which I've endorsed, which have a sort of moral circle that just expands in different ways so that, you know, you as a fellow person, a friend, very close, you know, then babies, then dogs, then caterpillars, and so on. But it, it misses the fact that there are sort of qualitative differences, and that that you, by dint of being a person, is a very different kind of moral relationship than my relationship to a chimp, however much I, our our dog, however much our baby, however much I'm, I must love them. I'll also add um, there's a line I think Henry Kissinger uh, was said to have said it, which is, "Academic politics are so savage because the stakes are so small," and <laughs> it was. And it was a joke, but but the truth here is because the, the tangible stakes are so small, we're not dealing with the fate of nations or that, the respect states stakes are very high indeed. And uh, so it's 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 so fierce and brutal like a high school playground is because respect is so much of our well, well you know i I've, I've wondered why in an academic um i don't want to devolve into academic politics but this i'm thinking of academic politics more philosophically um the the ones that are really visceral are the ones often are ones about hirings and what what kind of a person should we hire and the reason i figured out is because when i say well, you know, all right, I guess she's okay, but she's a neuroscientist and you're a neuroscientist. And I'm saying, yeah. you know, we don't want that because it's not really that important. And you're saying, I've spent my whole life during neuroscience. And now you're telling me that it's not worthy of an appointment in our department. So I, again, I'm coming back to the, the respect theme again, that you're not showing respect for me and my work and my field of study uh, that I've devoted myself to. Uh, that's real. That really gets people cranking. Yes. Yeah. And and, 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 and and some people some people see the amount of space you have as the amount of respect you're given in the department for how big a wig you are. At NYU, oh, there's so much to say. But NYU, <laughs> the, the apartments are given out. At least this used to be the case, based on your on your academic esteem, your, your publication rate. So you publish a paper in Nature of Science, all of a sudden you might get yourself an extra closet. Like that. <laughs> and, and this, can you, and can you imagine this? You, you know, you go over to your colleague's apartment and it's bigger than theirs because their H index is higher. And you'd like <laughs> to be able to escape from this at some point. But you're, but you're right. What, what every faculty member wants, more or less, isn't a raise. It's to have their colleagues come up and say, we think the world of you. We think the work you're doing is so important. You are so important in life, whatever department. And at times where I felt unsatisfied with my academic life is where, because I did when I, for either because it wasn't there or I wasn't getting, I felt disrespected. A really I, interesting I, question. Oh, sorry. A really interesting question has yeah. come in and I want to make sure we get to it. Okay, sure. Um, let's see. CB from Peterhouse asks, which insights on respect are worth considering and revisiting when trying to understand the ongoing situation in Israel-Palestine? Mike? Well, you're going to throw me the time bomb. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
I, you know, I, I, all I'll say is it's absolutely clear that respect is in many ways the central issue there. That's all I, that's all I really can say that uh, um, um, both sides feel disrespected by the other and they don't seem to be able to get out of this, um, uh, this gridlock. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I really agree. Don't know. Mm-hmm. I agree. It is not to say that there aren't there aren't some people to do this, some people to do that. No, no, nothing in life is perfectly symmetrical, but but you don't understand what's going on if you think, for instance, um, one group is this besieged people being preyed upon. Another group is malicious, evil oppressors. You know, basically each group feels deeply screwed, and deeply screwed, and deeply hate, and and I'll not just respect but other side. Each Palestinians, Israelis will deeply feel that they don't get the respect they want from the world's community. Well, I mean, if you look at, I mean, one of the one of the key sticking points for a while was the Palestinians needed to re- to, to recognize Israel as a country, which uh, recognize that whatever, and then the Palestinians uh, um, uh, in return want to be recognized as a, a different, a separate yes. people who can have their own territory, where the territory is a symbol of their independence and therefore their equal respect. So, I, yeah. And I, I heard Chomsky talk about this. And he said, like, what is this Israelis want to be recognized? People, countries don't recognize each other. Australia doesn't recognize Switzerland. But what he's missing is, it might sound like nothing. But to have one group say, we, 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 we recognize your right to exist is, is a powerful thing on, on both sides. Yeah. Um, Mike, it's a question about where you differ from Jonathan Haidt in regards to your development of morality as being socially constructed versus innate. Paul? I it was for you. Oh, I, you were breaking up and I didn't really hear, uh, hear the thing. Um, uh, I mean, I, I don't use the word innate uh, and, as, and, and no evolutionist really does. Uh, it's kind of paradoxical. The people who study evolution most use it least. Uh, you know, a developmental biologist doesn't say, you know, that the emergence of the limb buds in the 12th week of embryo is innate. I mean, that just, uh, you know, <laughs> of course, I mean, this is the biology doing its thing. So, of course, um, I would I would substitute the word maturation, which is a developmental term, which is that you have a developmental pathway toward, let's say, morality. And there are some maturational features of that. I think, you know, the, the, you don't learn to get a sense of fairness. You some, it somehow emerges through your interactions with others and whatnot. If you were on a desert island, you might not um, develop that because you would never have other people that you're interacting with uh, and so forth. So it's both the way I think I have a new a book. It's old now, <laughs> in 2019, Becoming Human where I talk about capacities and the sort of biological maturational capacities, and they have to be realized in development and in the case of morality and social interaction um, to, uh, to come to reality. So again, I can have all the capacities for fairness uh, built in, uh, uh, but if I never see another human being, if I'm on a desert island, I might not develop a sense of fairness. Um, and on the other hand, I can raise a, you know, a, a, a lizard in the most moral community there is, and he's not going to get a sense of fairness. So I know it's boring to say, but it's always both. And um, John Haidt may emphasize more uh, of, of some of the moral construction, but that's because when he focuses on things like disgust and things like that, th- those are much more culturally saturated than things like a sense of fairness. All right, last question actually comes from a response to you on Twitter, Paul. It's asking, how do we frame morality to get people to cooperate more these days? Um, You're not Twittering you while we're talking, are you, Paul? <laughs> no, I'm not live tweeting this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I have done that at, at, at times. Um, it's a good question. There's a lot of smart people, of course devoting their time to figure out how to persuade other people. Um, and some of the work is from a sort of John Haidt perspective, acknowledging that there are multiple modes of moral thought, something which I think Mike and I also agree on. So, so you could appeal to somebody's self-interest, but maybe you could also 
I think self-interest appeals are actually overblown. I think you might want to also appeal to their sense of justice or fairness or, or tribal loyalty. And, and asking the question is maybe you want people to do, um, to do more vaccines. And so it might, it might help to tell them, to persuade them that the people they respect are doing it. Um, it would be, you know, I, I read that, that at some place offered free beer for people to do vaccines and they were deluged. And I don't actually think I mean, free beer, if they gave them the same amount of money, it wouldn't have worked. And so there are all these tricks that psychologists have, moral psychologists have, more or less to get people what they do. But I would step back and think that, I, I understand the question, but maybe as psychologists, we should also acknowledge, maybe people don't want to cooperate and maybe they're right. I mean, there's all sorts of things, I'm, you know, Donald Trump wanted everybody to cooperate. Barack Obama wanted everybody to cooperate. You can't, but sometimes what moral psychology should say is not so much be so much focused on getting people to do what we want them to do, but understanding why they don't want to. And I also appreciate that, answer, right? This is the free speech part. <laughs> Well, you know, tolerance, uh, tolerance for others and their different ways, um, again, brings me back to my same uh, uh, theme of, of respect. And that's what um, I remember when I was a kid, I said, my grandfather said something. I said, I didn't like this kid in class or I didn't like something. He said, you have to tolerate it. Uh, and I said, uh, uh, or I said, I don't like it. He said, you don't have to like it. You have to tolerate it. If you liked it, you wouldn't have to tolerate it. All right. I think that is time. Thank you both so, so much. Thank you. Um, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> thanks for all the listeners. Um, and just a reminder of the events coming up this week. Um, tomorrow, we will be hearing from the CEO of Coca-Cola, James Quincy. <laughs> uh, on Monday, we will be doing our Colonial Artifacts panel and hearing from the South Korean ambassador, Anna Park. On Tuesday, we'll be hearing from the comedian, Joel Domit. On Wednesday, we have a panel on democracy and constitutionalism, as well as our first in-person event, Mental Health After Love Island. And next Thursday, we'll return to in-person debates with the motion, this house would break up big tech. Thank you so much for tuning in. And thank you again to Paul and Mike for their time. Uh, I'm so happy to be the opening act for the Coca-Cola CEO. Yes, yes. <laughs>